Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This week we are studying Parashat Noach, and we're starting a brand new year of studying Rav Shimshon Pikis. May his great merit be upon us. Amen v'amen. Take a look at this verse. And with this verse, we're going to, as Rav Pinka says, learn an amazing phenomenon from this story of Noah. Chapter 5, verse 32 in the book of Genesis. Vayhi Noah ben Hamesh Chana. Noah is 500 years old. Vayoled Noah et Shem et Ham bet Yafet. And then he finally has Shem, Ham, and Yafet, three sons. Rapinka says, let's picture at the time of Noah, the entire world's wicked, bad, evil, angering Hashem. There's one righteous man who believes in God. Noah is his name. It would have made a lot of sense that Hashem would reward Noah and bless him. However, we see the exact opposite, Rav Pinka says. Everyone, all the wicked people, were blessed with wealth, comfort, children. To the point where Hashem, in one way, loved them so much, human, humanity, that he gave them a piece of what it feels like to live in the world to come with all the comfort and glory. But the Misken, the Nebach, Noach, the righteous one, was lacking the greatest gift of all. And what's the greatest gift of all? Children. He was childless. 500 years old and he's childless. Everyone mocked him. Everyone told him, your righteousness is worthless, you good for nothing, you clown. 500 years this lasted and he suffered and he suffered and he suffered. So the laughing stock, not of town, of the world. But we know how this story ends. He eventually has three sons. We just read it. Who were the fathers of all mankind to survive the flood? Not one popular, strong, wealthy, wise person that was mocking Noah from before the flood had any descendants. They were all washed away with the great flood. Now this phenomenon, Rav Pinkus says, of the righteous surviving, which started back towards the beginning of the world, repeats itself time and time again throughout history. He says something that's very funny. When I was reading, when I was reading Rapinkis this afternoon, when I was reading this part, he, although it's in Hebrew, the words of Lahavdil Elif Havdalot, Mark Twain came to mind. And I'll tell you what Rapinkis says, and it's very similar to what Mark Twain said about the Jewish people. In Rav Pincus's words, many empires have risen with power, wealth, control, beauty, etc. And they all filled the world with their splendor. Yet each and every one of them had their own personal flood. And they were erased off the world only to be learned about of their extinction in the books of history. But the Jewish people, even though we have our own floods, not once, but hundreds of times, we live and survive and have survived them all. And why is that? Rapinka says, because of our ark. Just like Noah was saved in his ark, we're saved in our ark. We enter our ark that protects us every single time from the floods that come our way. And what's our ark, Rapinka says? It's our Bet Knesset and Bet Midrash, our synagogues and our study halls. It's our prayers and our Torah study. That is our ark that saves us from the chaos and the flooding world. How appropriate 
is such a beautiful Dvar Torah when unfortunately we see the chaos that's going on in this world. And it's been like this no different than any other time. It's just a different flavor every time. How important it is the beginning of the year to remind ourselves, do you know what's going to save us from drowning? Going into the ark. What's the ark? Going to pray at synagogue. Going to learn at the yeshiva, at the kola, at the Torah center. It's a beautiful, beautiful message. So that's one part piece I wanted to share from Rapinkus. Now I want to jump to the end. That's from the beginning of the parsha. I want to jump to the end of the parsha. Rapinkus says that the book of Genesis has another name, an alternate name for it. It's called, instead of not only Sefer Bereshit, it's also called, so called Sefer Hayashar, the straight book. Why is it called that? Because the book of Genesis speaks to us about our patriarchs, our fathers, their straightness, their exceptional righteousness, and their devotion and dedication to God. And the Torah shares to, uh, with us these stories so that we learn their ways and we try to follow their path as much as we can. Now, along with learning about the tzaddikim, the righteous people, we also have some less righteous characters in our Torah. But they're also a very important part of our learning. We've spoken about this many times, even about Paro. All the wickedness of Paro, but Paro teaches us so many lessons. And Rav Pinka says, because if it were not important, the Torah would not have written it. Every single word, every single letter in the Torah is holy and divine. So if it's written, there's something for us to be learned. At the end of this week's Torah portion, after the generation of the flood and the generation of the Tower of Babel, the Torah lists the ten generations between Noah and Abraham, setting the stage for the upcoming Torah portions that are going to discuss our patriarchs and matriarchs and, and the twelve tribes and getting the Jewish people into the land of Egypt. We read about Abraham picking up at the end of this week's Torah portion and leaving his hometown, or Kastim, and heading towards Canaan, the soon-to-be land of Israel, stopping at Haran on the way. Now, the Torah tells us something very interesting. Vayamot Haran, and Haran, Abraham's brother, dies. al Terach Aviv, during the lifetime of his father, Terach. Be'eretz Molat Tobi'ur Kastim, in the land of his birth in ur -Kastim. So what's going on over here? The Midrash tells us the famous story of Abraham destroying his father's idols, who was an idol maker and seller, destroys them. Finally, he is put in front of Nimrod, the king of the time. Huge idolater. He even, you know, had people worship him. Facing Nimrod, he says indeed that he destroyed the idols, that he doesn't believe in any of them. It's all bubkis, ridiculousness. And if there's only one true God, it is the creator God, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Nimrod forces Abraham to revoke his opinion and to bow down to him. And Abraham says no. So Nimrod throws him into the fiery furnace. And as a miracle, Abraham survives. God makes a miracle. While after that happened, now Nimrod looks at Abraham's brother, Haran, and says, who are you with? Are you with me or with Abraham? So Haran said, I'm with Abraham, my brother. Nimrod says, perfect. You too in the furnace. Let's see if a miracle is going to happen for you. Haran is thrown into the furnace and burns to death. Hmm. Why was the miracle for Abraham and not for his brother? Well, Midrash Rashi tells us also. Haran said in his mind, while Abraham was thrown in, if Abraham survives, I'll be on his side. If Abraham dies and Nimrod asks me, who side am I on? I'll say I'm with you, Nimrod, no problem. So Abraham risks his life for God and is saved by a miracle. Haran is, does the same, risks his life. No miracle done to be saved. We understand why. It's because he obviously didn't have the right intention. He's a flip-flop, as they say. Or rather, he was a politician. Right? 
let's leave that thought there. Let's move on. Riff Pinkus says, we have to look at Tyran. The Torah is telling us about Tyran for a specific reason. There's something for us to learn. Tyran was not committed with his intentions. However, he still gave up his life for God. Does that not deserve some reward? What reward did he get? Riff Pinkus says, look at Tyran's children. Hiram's two children were Sarah and Lot. <sighs> Sarah, the first matriarch of the Jewish people. Lot, who had two great righteous women come from him, Ruth and Naama, who were the mothers of the household of King David and, and, and the mother of, of Mashiach. We see from here, Rapinka says, that any good deed even without pure intentions, will be rewarded by Hashem. Sometimes, Rapinka says, you see people, and they're doing great things, and they're doing great things for fame and fanfare. You know, they're donating money just to have their name up on a wall, or just to, do, to, to, to have their name up on a building. Now, I'm not saying to have your name up on a wall or on a building is wrong, but if that's the only reason why you're doing it, that's not pure intentions. That's for pride and greed and power and who knows why. Rafinka says, don't discount those good deeds. Those good deeds are still going to be paid for, meaning they're going to be rewarded for. Hashem rewards them. As the Talmud says, from doing good deeds with the wrong intentions, not that I don't want to say the wrong intentions, with from doing, doing good deeds with not intentions purely for Hashem, people will come to doing deeds that are purely for Hashem. And therefore, the same is true for us. Everything we do, we just have to keep on doing. Do good, do good, do good. Whether it's for a perfect intention, or imperfect intention, right intention, not right intention, mixture, just keep on doing good. Eventually, they will work themselves out. And the more you learn and the more you do, your intentions will be L'Shem Shemaim for Hashem's sake. So, Rav Pincus, in my words, is telling us that there is no good deed that goes unrewarded. Not like the common saying that no good deed goes unpunished. Like this. No good deed goes unrewarded. So keep on doing good, because even Haran, who was not with a complete heart with HaKadosh Baruch Hu when he did, when he gave his life up. He was still rewarded to having Sarah and Lot, which were amazing contributions to the Jewish people. And may we have great merit to contribute in our own ways towards the Jewish people, through ourselves, our good deeds, our charity, our Torah study, and most importantly, our children and our grandchildren, our descendants. Amen v'amen.